Well, it's a great honour and pleasure to have a chance to talk to Harun Ahmed. We've cohabited in Cambridge for many years without having had a conversation, so thank you very much for coming this afternoon. I always start by asking when and where a person is born. Um, your Wikipedia doesn't give you your date of birth, and I, but I presume that's just an oversight. Um, I was born in Calcutta, in India, in 1936. Um, my parents are not from that region of India. My father happened to be just posted in that particular city at that time when I was born, when three of his children were born there. Um, tell, tell me about your ancestry as far back as you would like to go. Because, um, um, my father was a middle-ranking civil servant in the Indian civil service. My mother uh, married at the age of 17. So she'd only just about finished school. My grandfather from my maternal side had died before I was born. I just know him to be also a minor administrator who was involved. He was like a justice of the peace, so, um, uh, J J JP equivalent, and he used to be involved in dispensing justice under the guidance of the local commissioner, whoever was in charge, usually an, a young Englishman. Uh, but my maternal grandfather, I, I knew well as a boy, and he was a civil engineer, but a very successful businessman who made a fortune by building bits of New Delhi under while Lichens was doing it, uh, and also got involved in building airfields in the eastern border of India when the Japanese invasion was really? feared. Whereabouts in Kohima or um, They were along the coastline mm. um, and it's an interesting story because um, much later on, of course they were not never used no. um, and then abandoned mm. but the concrete slabs, the trees and bushes and shrubs grew under them and broke up these slabs mm. much later on people, more or less explorers of that region, <laughs> discovered them. Discovered these concrete slabs and then a story came out that these had been. Uh, but he made a lot of money through mm. those entrepreneurial activities mm. and um, built himself a very fine house in New Delhi, mm. where I mostly grew up, up to mm. as a young boy, until the partition of India mm. in 1947. So that's my maternal grandfather, my maternal grandmother died when my mother was only 12 mm. and she was a remarkable woman in some ways because she was a photographer in those days and um, this is a singular achievement to have been a photographer and she drove a car which was also for a Gosh, woman in yes. India to be doing that, an Indian woman uh, was, was most unusual. So I'm sorry that I never met her. Mm. But maybe uh, she influenced my mother a great deal. Mm. This must have been in the 1920s, I suppose. She was driving her car and taking yes. photographs. Yes, uh, it's, um, mm. it's true. It was a Chevrolet. So it was an American mm. car. I mm. just remember the name. I <laughs> just came back suddenly. I could not, cannot dream of how I kids come back, but mm. sort of childhood memories have come back. Mm. What is, in fact, your first childhood memory? apart from the sort of waving trees in the background of your pram, but any, any concrete memories from your early life? Oh, that's... Um, um, no, I have not any very worrying memory of my very early years, except a very loving and caring home, mm. which I was the third child. Rather pampered, I think because the first two were girls and boys tend to be rather pampered in India and Pakistan. Mm. I was rather feel that I was pampered. I'm not sure whether I was or not. Anyway, we had a very loving home and growing up in a very easy sort of way. Did you have ayahs? We had ayahs. Um, I suppose my... I'm, I'm six years older than my younger, young brother and I suppose my earliest memories were being jealous of him. 
Uh, your uh, mentioning Aya reminded mm. me that he had an Aya, and I was not growing out of Ayas because I was going to school, and I greatly resented that he was staying at home and I was going to school. Mm. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> it's one of these strange memories mm. that comes back. But the first definitive memories are those of the partition of India mm. when I was 10, 11. We'll just get on to those in a moment, but tell me more about your parents and their character um, oh. in so far as they have has affected you obviously deeply, but what sort of people were they? My father, as I said, was a middle-ranking civil servant who had um, trained as an engineer and had gone to Germany between the two wars. So there, he was there in time of high, hyperinflation, so that will date him into the 30s. Hmm. Um, and he had gone with a group of Indian students who were not welcome in either India or in the United Kingdom because of having part, uh, participated in the non-cooperation movements. So he was at Daligar University where he got into trouble because of being involved in political agitation. So he went up there. He was, a, as far as his character is concerned, he was a very mild and unassuming man who had taken a degree of diploma engineer in Germany, which was very highly regarded in Germany. But um, because the British qualifications were more valued in India, so when he returned, he, he, he worked as an engineer and became a reasonably high-ranking civil servant. Mm. And, but um, his character was very mild and unassuming, and, but very good-natured. Mm. I just felt he Did was he most, push you at all? Uh, no, he? he didn't push me. He was so tolerant and mm. he didn't feel like pushing me, but my mother did. Mm. My goodness, my mother did. Um, she was only 17 when she married. But Were they cousins or anything like this? No, no, there was no relationship mm. between them, and that was good. Um, my gr maternal grandfather, mm. says a rich man, had to some extent supported my father's education. Mm. And when he realized how clever my father was, and he's come back as a diploma engineer, he was, uh, the marriage was arranged. <laughs> so it was an arranged marriage? Mm -hmm. Very definitely. She was only 17 and he mm. was uh, 15 years older. Mm. So it was definitely a arranged marriage. And that was one of the things that I suppose defines my relationship with my parents. My mother was young. Mm. My father was older always. Mm. And very staid and sort of calm about things. My mother was very excitable. And, mm and a uh, very forceful character and she made us do our homework and taught us to speak English at a very early age. Um, read a great deal herself, although fairly light fiction, but she'd been to very good schools. Mm. She'd had an English governess, which was because my father was rich, my grandfather was wealthy. So anyway, she was a very strong influence on me, but I was the most strong influence was my sister. Which one? Uh, I had Two sisters, well, mm. the first, for the eldest of the two sisters, was three years older than me. And she's, um, as I said to you earlier when we were lunching, mm. that I came under the influence of a number of women. Mm. But she was very strong because she was uh, very in immensely clever. And I had to run to keep up with her. Mm. And to be three years younger and chasing mm. behind this person was very useful for me because I read three years before I should be reading her things that mm. she was reading and absorbing things because she would bring into the house a lot of things that um, I would never have had access to. Mm. So she was very strong in her. And, and she was quite protective of you, she wasn't, didn't bully you or anything? She didn't bully me but she wasn't protective, she mm. thought I was, I was spoiled. Mm. And she sometimes hid her books from me and sort of thing. <laughs> but we retained to this day, mm. we're all both old now but the happiest of friendships. Mm. So we joke with each other, we talk to each other about, we send emails about what we read and so on, to this day, mm. which is, so that's sort of... Your, your mother, years. leaping far ahead, but your mother um, took control of your life later on too, in bringing you perhaps to come to Cambridge. Uh, but she was always, she was always in control of my life. Until, until I was married, I think. Mm. 
she would know intimate details of what I was up to. Mm. And she was a very forceful character. She, all her children, she... Mm, Organised their lives. <laughs> she, she looked after them, yes. Mm. She sort of made sure that they were... She was fully informed and nobody would be unaware of her views on what we were doing. They, she would state them in a very forthright manner. Um, so she did come to England with me. Mm. We'll come to Kings then later. What what religious background were your parents? Uh, my parents were both Muslims, mm. brought up in, but neither uh, was very forcefully, mm. was very religious, strongly religious. They didn't pray regularly. Mm. Um, on Eid days, we would all be off to Eid prayers. It's mm. like going for to church. Christmas is the only day you go to church, as many families in this country do. Um, we were on, of that category that we went on the day of the major religious festival. So I think my father was agnostic more than anything else, but paid lip service to being a good Muslim. Mm -hmm. I mean, we wouldn't, for example, we obeyed all the sort of general rules of not having alcohol or pork or something, but nobody went to pray mm. regularly. Uh, so that was the religious background. Mm. Mm. You must have been, um, you were born in 36, you must have been seven or eight during the Bengal famine. Yes. I was just um, um, at that time beginning to read the newspaper. Mm. So I would, I would run out, I'd wake up early, and the idea was to get hold of the newspaper before Dad got it, mm. before because Father took it off with him, with him, mm. and uh, we didn't get a chance to read it then until much later on. So I would then rush to the newspaper to read it, and I became aware of the famine. Yes, but you know it didn't make a big impact upon me. It was your your household wasn't affected at all. No, no, we were not in Bengal then. We were oh. back in Delhi by oh, that I see. time. So we were not affected, but we were affected by the news. Mm. And in, but mm, it was partition that was mm. coming, and that was the big. Did you know Ian Stevens? Yes, I did. Who was the editor of the Statesman? Mm, yes, I did. I met him here at uh, in Cambridge mm. when he came here, uh, and he was a Kingsman, wasn't he? Yes, he was. So I met him in Hall or somewhere mm. and we started talking and we both discovered. So I, I read his book, The mm. Horned Moon. Yes, I did too. Yes, mm. so I, I didn't know him and then he lived in Chesterton or somewhere. Mm. He came to tea with us, yes, when my children were young. Mm. My wife reminded me of that. He came to tea with us and then mm. my little daughter untied his shoelaces which gave him great. <laughs> 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 yes, a nice man. Yes. Yes, very good. Well, you mentioned um, the part partition several times. Were you in Delhi when that happened? Or? Yes, uh, we were in Delhi. My father was a minor civil servant and one of the jobs that he was given was to help with the partition of the assets between India and Pakistan. It made him a key target for the uh, people who were trying to destroy the formation of Pakistan, so to speak. Mm. But um, So he was attacked and then we were in great danger, the family. When you say attacked, attacked? Well, he was attacked on the... his car was followed mm. and rammed. Mm. He escaped because um, it was rammed very near a police station and he ran into a police station and then from there he telephoned and managed to get himself rescued to, so we, they, he and my uncle came to the house and we were bundled with just what we were wearing. That memory is very clear mm. into, and then we went off to the refugee camp. To the refugee camp? Yes, we then, um, we, that was the only way, way you could be safe then. So the refugee camps were set up mm. in parts of Delhi and we had a refugee camp in the the same house and area in which my great grandfather lived. Mm. So that whole area was set up as a refugee camp because there was a Muslim community there. And the men patrolled the area with guns. 
mm. and weapons, and all the children and women and so on were huddled into very uncomfortable spaces, and we were in this refugee camp for months. Months? Mm. Two or three months. I, I mean, my mm. memory is not clear because time for children is is odd, isn't it? It's sort of punctuated by other things and, and it's sort of serial incidents. time. Mm. I said, certainly there was long enough, and certainly was there for long enough to feel very threatened, and mm. certainly there with the memory of that I was being taught as a 10-year-old or 11-year-old to fire a gun mm. by, by the men who were patrolling, say, you know, if, if we are attacked and we are killed, you grab the gun and fight. Mm. So it is, it's interesting memories that. Mm. It's a long time ago. But you weren't attacked and, and you didn't have to fire your gun and... We were, when this refugee camp was under threat, we were lucky we got a mercy flight. There were, there were sort of flights being run between Delhi and Karachi, and they were Dakotas, and um, we then went to the airport by, by a route, which was very frightening also, because we escaped in a car with my mother lying on top of us to hide the children, because you see, now, you, you probably won't want to put this in the thing, but it's an interesting story it, that they were attacking cars in which families were going. Mm. It's vicious. Mm. Communal violence is the worst. Ethnic cleansing, as it's mm. called now. Um, and, but if they saw a lone driver, they were too busy hacking the others, to, and they would just pass them through. Mm. So my mother lay down on top of us and hid behind. So it appeared as only as that my father was driving, and we therefore escaped through the checkpoints to the airport and then we were able to go in a Dakota. I, I remember there were no seats in the Dakota. I lay, the children sat in the middle galleyway. Mm. That was an escape from. Mm. So all this must have very much disrupted any schooling you were having earlier on because you presumably started at uh, your first school in the second grade. Yes, in Delhi. Yes, I was uh, at St. Columbus School in Delhi and um, I had was perfectly good education, but my mother had taught us English, mm. which was a great advantage to go to school speaking almost perfect English and mm. um, no doubt with an accent which I have never lost, but uh, very uh, very well formed mm. vocabulary and contextual English. You and, and talk English at home or, uh, at all? We talked all too. Mostly, mm. oh, we all scolded Nuru, <laughs> <laughs> mm. but we did talk a mixture of Urdu and English. Mm. But if, whenever we could, we talked English, and the children talked English to each other. Mm. Uh, my sister was so much cleverer than me; she was she was able to also help mm. to make sure that we were getting it right. So we did, did talk in English. Uh, then I went to St. Patrick's School in Karachi when we went there. Mm. Do you remember any of the teachers there at St. Patrick's? Oh, oh yes, yes I do. How, how long were you there? I mean, from about age of 10 to...? Age of 11, mm. really. I'd gone to 11 by the time we got there, um, to, to 16, mm -hmm. when I did my O-levels. Yeah. I was at St. Patrick's School. Mm. Yes, I do remember the teachers. They, it was a, a Catholic missionary school with Irish priests. St. Patrick's. Mm. <laughs> um, um, they were all, uh, they, were, they were priests from all over, um, from across the world, but um, they, I think the principal used to be always somebody from uh, I, I, uh, an Irish priest, mm. uh, but, but later it became more general, yes. Mm. And it was a good school. You, on the whole. It was uh, regarded as the sort of second best school at that time in Karachi. The grammar, Karachi Grammar School was the best, mm. um, and this was regarded as second best school. I think my parents would have liked me to go to Karachi Grammar School, but I think I, we weren't important enough. <laughs> yeah, I thought you were going to say rich enough, or um, you hadn't got your. I think they might have actually found the money, but they, they'd come out destitute. Mm. They had no no money whatsoever, but they might have borrowed the money to send us there, but we were not. Important. How did your 
I mean, you say they came out without any money and presumably no job for your father either. Well, there he was lucky because uh, he was a civil servant and mm -hmm. when the transfer of assets took place, one of the transfers was that civil servants on both sides were retained. So mm -hmm. anybody fleeing from the Pakistan side, and that was also mm -hmm. the case, we must say, the quid pro quo was that anybody who went from the Pakistan side to India got their job and mm -hmm. very from fleeing from India to Pakistan also retained their job. So he got his, kept his job. Mm. But um, we had only the clothes we were wearing. Mm. And uh, fortunately with the job also came a, a house. Mm. So he was able to get a house and a job mm. more or less straight away. So within a month he was getting a salary. Mm. Uh, we didn't have to, we didn't suffer all that much. I mean, mm. we did suffer to the extent nothing but clothes. <laughs> Uh, but it didn't seem a hardship compared with what other people were suffering. Mm. We counted our blessings and said we mm. were lucky. I mean, it's not really part of your life story directly, but I mean, all of us who are looking back on that, particularly British people and reading accounts, feel that the whole thing was such a terrible mess um, and handled so badly by the British. Is that your feeling about it? The speed, I mean, that, that it was done too rapidly. Yes, I think most uh, historians, it is history now, most yeah. historians are now aware that the urgency which Mr. Lord Mountbatten brought mm. to the matter was most unwise and mm. uncaring. Exactly. And yeah. In fact, um, there's no better truism to say than to say that um, one English officer with a, a dozen sepoys would hold thousands of Indians in check. Mm. They did, after all. Mm. But at that point, the white man was missing from all the incidents that were taking place. The police tried and also mm. the army tried and so on, but nobody succeeded. Mr. Gandhi tried, but nobody succeeded because the mm. discipline of having white officers there mm. was no longer there. And that meant that riots took place and the mm. whole thing fell apart. So you're right, perhaps. Yeah. Mm, yes. It was hasty and it was really uncalled for, except. Exactly. It's just personal pride and so on. Anyway, um, I'm not an expert on it either, so let's, let's move on. I mean, on St. Patrick's, um, you're getting a teenager now. What? What and you're now quite a keen sportsman still. Were you beginning to play cricket and mm. squash and things? Yes, uh, no, I was not playing squash, I was playing cricket. Mm. And cricket was the love of my life, and I was playing cricket all the time. And mm. that was the main difficulty with my mother because she would catch me and bring me back from wherever she found me by my <laughs> ear to study. <laughs> but I played cricket, yes. I played cricket all the time. I played cricket with a lot of people. Many of my peers went on to become test cricketers and um, played at very high level. Um, I was the most unfortunate. Hmm. That, uh, well, a friend uh, of mine, is a, I think he's written a book on Indian cricket and he's a, certainly a a commentator, Ramchandra Guha. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. And uh, he's occasionally tried to explain the obsession with cricket. I mean, I played it, obviously, but I never took to it particularly why it should get inside the soul of not only Australians and Jamaicans, but also the British. And Indians, you see. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting. Mir Bose's book is excellent on that. He mm. talks about early cricket um, in India and how uh, it really fascinates Indians and Pakistan as mm. the game to play. Mm. Um, partly it's because it can be played without physical contact. Pakistan and India, they don't like think like physical contact games. Soccer and rugby are not played. Interesting. And I've all, always wondered about that, why be, I'm so hopeless at, at soccer and rugby. Well, the, I had a theory from my friend Andre Bataille that the reason there were no restaurants in India for till the British brought them, I mean, I'm summarising a bit, was that the caste system. 
you know, but you couldn't tell who was cooking for you. Mm. I wonder whether that might apply to physical contact too. It could well be that that was the reason. It may well be that it's that sort of national characteristic that we mm. don't, we keep separate. The space between mm. us is mm. is different, and the physical contact theory is one that I evolved that people mm. didn't like. Uh, they they do wrestling and so on, but that's a sort of separate thing with the physical contact of these games and being hurt. Mm. Whereas cricket didn't bring any of these mm. uh, aspects in, and hockey, field hockey, which is played in India is also relatively free of contact. Yes, they the developed stick. a famous hockey stick, didn't they, the Indian? Yeah, yeah, the, the curved stick. Mm, mm, <laughs> chose to play with. But, um, so, cricket was your obsession, but you did a little bit of... W what else did you do at school? No, I think uh, at, while I was at school, I did only cricket. Because I played ping pong and uh, mm. table tennis, you like, mm. and... Um, mucked around with a hockey stick. I played hockey as well. But um, no, cricket was so overwhelming a need to play cricket all the time, to train for cricket, to practice cricket, to do all the things, read cricket books, play cricket board games and, and no television. Well, the, the other great advantage, I suppose, in India is you can more or less play it nearly all the year, except for the monsoon. Yeah, we played it all the year round, and and mm. I was captain of the cricket team, and I was um, I had this other advantage that I could read and do sums. Mm -hmm. um, big advantage to be that if I misinterpreted the rules to my <laughs> <laughs> shame from time to time. <laughs> I had a rule book. I I was passionate about cricket. It's this. Mm. It still is you, something that I still do. I, mm. I don't play anymore, of course, mm. but. I do watch it and I mm. do follow it very closely. Mm. Mm. What about music? Were you interested in music at all? Um, none, no interest whatsoever. I didn't listen to music. I didn't uh, have any musical training or mm. whatsoever. No, no instruments? You didn't play anything? No, my, my mother and sisters sort of dabbled with harmonium and things, but mm. um, I, I didn't. Absolutely none. In fact, later in life, much later in life, mm. having married a wife who's very musical, mm. living in an environment which is very musical, of course I turned towards music to mm. sort of find out more about it and I do enjoy it now hugely mm. Mm. when I listen to it, but it's never been a passion. Mm. What sort of music do you like now? Um, I listen to classical music, I listen to whatever is um, um, being played by my wife. Mm. Tom. She plays the violin in a number of sort of little informal groups and she goes to the Endelian mm. um, as a regular subscriber. Mm. And um, um, I went once or twice, but then I said, no, I'm mm. not, I'm sleeping through it, so I'm not <laughs> going to go. So music has never mm. been part of my life. Mm. Mm. So, were there any, I mean, I mentioned any teachers. Do, do you remember any before your O-levels who inspired you particularly, or was, were there, was it after that? that uh, you see, I went to a school where the quality of teaching was very poor. Was it? Uh, so bad. And this is the second best school in Karachi. Yes, I was already aware that. Mm -hmm. I wasn't being taught very much. Um, I also suffered from the fact that I was big, mm. which is a great handicap because I suppose I, I was big and sort of looked stupid as well. <laughs> um, you you pushed you, you know in a in a classroom in which you s sat in ranks. Mm. Um, they often put the big boys at the back, mm. quite sensibly. But if the big boy also has bad eyesight, <laughs> it's <laughs> it means that. You don't see very much of the black Yes, because so. you've got sh you're short-sighted. Yes. At what age did you develop that? I mean, at 12 I was short-sighted, although it mm. took them a little while for my parents to discover. How old were you when they discovered it? I think it was a year, 14, 13 or 14, a mm. year or two after they discovered that I was unable mm. to see anything. Mm. Um, so clearly one of the advantages was that I learned to listen. Mm. I could listen to the teacher, but I couldn't see mm. what 
they were writing on the blackboard. So you went up at the end of the lesson and looked to see what was on the blackboard? I just heard it. I mm. just heard it. And I, as I heard it, I made notes. Mm. It, was, um, it was, I think, very, very important for me because I was having to listen. Mm. And paying attention is an important aspect of one's uh, learning anything. Mm. And paying attention was what came then. The other advantage of doing that was that then you understood what you were being taught if you paid attention, mm. so you had more time for cricket. You didn't have to revise it, mm. you didn't have to learn it from anybody else. So the teachers were not good. I remember the maths teacher being particularly poor mm. because I could do maths mm. um, instinctively, I suppose, and it didn't bother me. There was no difficulty in concepts and so on, and the ma I knew that the maths teacher wasn't getting it right. Mm. Uh, the English teacher was way below the standard of my sister, I felt, so my mm. sister was leading me there. Mm. So the teaching was actually really bad, that's why I was talking to you earlier, I was saying that one has to look at starting points. Mm. And that starting point was that the teaching was bad, but there were other influences which were very strong. Mm. Your mother and sister? My mother and sister were both very good and the English was coming very easily and I was reading way beyond. Can you remember what you were reading? I was reading Jane Austen, I was mm. reading the Bronte sisters, I was reading um, Stevenson. I, my favourite book at that time was uh, Treasure Island mm -hmm. as a little boy. I was reading the classical English literature much to my amazement when I later on was among scientists in Cambridge. Um, and engineers, and I thought this is quite remarkable how much better educated I am. <laughs> <laughs> Although I might not be the same level as a scientist, so somehow I, got, I have been educated uh, in a distant part of the world, in, mm. at least in English literature. Mm. So what did we read? We, we read every, anything we could lay our hands on. We went to the, she took me to the British Council and to the American I, U, US Information Services mm. and we borrowed books from there and she would take me along because she needed an escort, mm. this is sister. And so we took the books, I remember a British Councilwoman saying to her and to me, oh you're back again, have you read them all? We had. And she was <laughs> just as surprised as anybody could be that we had. Mm. Mm. I think my sister was actually tested to make sure <laughs> she, <read them laughs> she <all>. had. <laughs> what about religion at this stage? Uh, it's a Catholic school, you're a... Um, um, no, I must Muslim. tell you then, if that's still of interest, I'd, I'd keep away from the subject of religion nowadays. Um, it, when I was 10 or 11, as I said, I was in a refugee camp. I asked mm. my father a pertinent question, why? Why are we in a refugee camp? Why are they trying to kill us? And he told me very honestly, look, these are riots between people of the Hindu religion and people of the Muslim religion. So the, it's a religious um, conflict that is taking place. And that's how it is. It is partly on land, of course, but I was that not to know. And I decided then, as a thinking child, that religion was not good for one. <laughs> and so religion was abandoned then. Mm -hmm. It then abandoned forcefully. My mother was aware of it and scolded me sometimes, you know, you mustn't do that. You don't understand, you're not old enough. But I had talked with him, he had been completely honest with me, and then he accepted that I would not have any religious belief after that. And that has remained the case. That has totally remained the case. And it remained the case as I sat through many religious services. Mm. Well, I always ask, I've, I've interviewed more than a dozen heads of houses in Cambridge, many of whom preside at Trinity or King's and so on, and you had to preside at the, the body of Christ College, yes. Corpus Christi. Um, did, I always ask them if they feel a bit hypocritical or uh, uneasy doing this. I, I did. When, when, when so unexpectedly this honour was bestowed upon me that I was to be master, I went to the four or five clerics in the college and I, I talked with some of the fellows and they said, look, I have no religious beliefs. I am, however, very strongly believe that you and everybody has the right to their religious beliefs 
and I would support that very strongly. And one of them said to me, which I remember to this day, well, Master-elect, if you are prepared to do your duty, we do not hold that against you. I thought that was wonderful. I actually was rather moved by that, and I said, well, look, if that's the trust they have in me, I will go to even so. <laughs> I was fortunate that I married to a vicar's daughter. Uh -huh. So she, in Corpus at least, um, well, long before I went, I had, of course, learnt a great deal about the Anglican faith mm. because she is a vicar's daughter and her father was at Christ here. Her mm. grandfather was at Corpus Christi and her great-grandfather all became vicars. <laughs> <So> <laughs> what a history to come to. <laughs> so I was very, uh, I, I wouldn't say tolerant, I think that's the wrong word. I was very supportive of other people's religious beliefs. Mm. So when I went into Evensong, I didn't know the hymns, but she kn knows them without even looking at mm. <laughs> the hymn book. Uh, so she sang and she sings and she's musical. So we um, went into chapel and I did my duty and I read the lesson when I was asked to. I read well. <laughs> I don't, that, that sounds terribly immodest. We'll cut that out. <laughs> no, I read mm. and uh, I like to read. and. So I read the lesson when required, I did mm. my bit, I read the names of benefactors, I did everything. Mm. And some were constrained to say that um, you do that well. So I did it as my duty, mm. but without any feeling. Mm. Um, hypocritical now. I don't think so. I don't think I'd describe it as that. I was quite honestly believed that I was doing my duty and to mm. others who had a strong religious belief and that I would support them. I've um, I mean, you're, I think you were chairman of the Philosophical Society, or president, president yes. of the Philosophical Society, so you've obviously thought uh, about many things philosophical as well as your particular uh, discipline. Um, I've asked a lot of scientists in particular, um, because there has been recently a lot of debate with the Dawkins and people about whether religion and um, science are mutually exclusive or not. And I've noticed an interesting difference between biologists, for example, who are very hostile to religion, and physicists who are much more kind of mystical and say, like Einstein, you know, there's something there but we don't know what it is and it's not a god and so on and so on. I wondered uh, whether you've, you said you were very tolerant and supportive even, but, so you don't think that religion has been destroyed by science? No, I certainly don't think religion has been destroyed by science. I wouldn't um, uh, dream of being critical about people's beliefs in religion. It is so overwhelming a force. Wearing completely another hat, I'm, I have a great interest in cathedrals. Mm. I look with awe at these cathedrals. They started building them in the 11th century. And what powerful forces have moved these people? who then built these marvellous cathedrals and through... If you look at the history, well, you can look at the history of the chapel, but you can look at the history of some of these cathedrals. They were built, they were torn down, they were built, rebuilt, fire, invaders, and yet there they rise above the sky. You look at the mosques in uh, Islamic countries and what wonderful buildings are created for the adoration of God. So I have a very great support of religion. It is just a personal view, which I have very strongly, that religion is not for me, and that religion taken to any extreme is very, very dangerous. And that is why these communal riots arose and so on. But very often the religion was used as an excuse for land grabbing and various other mm. Mm, wishes that people had in different parts of the world. So the conflict was not necessarily based around religion, but sometimes that was the very basis of it. Now, I think my religious beliefs were colored by the effect of partition mm -hmm. and remained with me ever since. So I brought up my family to believe, my children anyway, to believe that they have to be extremely tolerant to have strong principles, um, but they don't necessarily have to be based on religion to be based on 
the care of other human beings. Hmm. Let's move on from St. Patrick's. You, you did O-levels, you say, and then where did you go after that? So I started um, in the in um, what is pre pre uh, pre engineering hmm. degree college. It's hmm. called a college in Pakistan. And just at that time, my father was transferred to England. Hmm. To he he was having great difficulty with his career, um, in, and he chose to be transferred to the equivalent position at the embassy. His job was to um, inspect and um, categorize industrial equipment for the industrialization of Indian, mm. of India and Pakistan. So his job was to actually purchase this equipment, but before that to inspect it and check its technical quality and so on. So he got this job in the Pakistan High Commission here and he brought his family with him. So in 1954 we came to England and I then, and that was a formative experience as far as the teacher was concerned because I then went to Chiswick Polytechnic mm. to do my A-levels because I had to do my A-levels then mm. because the Pakistan qualification I hadn't completed it anyway, didn't count for getting mm. into university. Mm. And that's the first time I tried to get into Cambridge. And uh, then I was sent this information that needed Latin to do engineering. Did you know that? <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. Not well, Greek at that time, at least. No, not Greek, but Little Go, what it was called then. <laughs> I'm old enough to have been, tried to get in when it was necessary to do Latin <laughs> for engineering. I thought that it was um, not some... I mean, yeah. at that age, one yeah. can't wait a year. Yeah. Somebody said, you know, it, you could do it in a year. Hmm. No, I'm not waiting for a year, so I went to Imperial College. Mm. But before that, I'd been to Chiswick Polytechnic, and there was um, a very, very good experience because they were so kind to me. And I think this is one of the things I'd say about British education systems, and later I was to learn to be part of it, or how fair it was. Because I went there and uh, she tested me, the maths teacher, Miss, Miss, Miss Tompkins. Was she Miss, oh. Miss Tompkins? Name come back. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, um, and she said, uh, You can do all these sums which uh, and problems which are way above what all your the other children at this school can do. Because this is a polytechnic where those who fail their GCSE don't do too well mm -hmm. come in mm -hmm. to sort of try and do their A level with a second mm -hmm. chance. So she gave me her the the books and her solutions book and said get on with it and every now and then she'd come and sort of ask me if I'd got stuck and she was wonderful she pushed me um, way ahead of the others the physics teacher did a similar a uh, benefit to me because he saw that I could do I could understand physics and so he made me his assistant. I had to lay out the classroom for the experiments and help him to do the experiment before the other children came to do it. Very lucky. I was extraordinarily lucky. So they made a big impact upon me and helped me. And then I got into Imperial College. So you must have, this must have been in the early 50s you came? 54. 54 I came, we came here. 55 I went to Imperial. Hmm in the October of 55. To read engineering? To do electrical engineering, yes. Mm. That's what I Can studied. you remember, just going back one step, your first memory of England? I mean, did mm, very you, clear. You, you must have had an image before you came, and how did it fit? Yes, we had, uh, we, my sister and I had read a lot about England. Mm. We also had these passions for cricket, which she shared, actually. <laughs> Uh, cricket herself, watching cricket, and um, so we we knew a lot about England. But we were we we, we remember landing with BOAC. That's the British always. Mm, yes, yes, I, I flew in it. Yes. Oh yes. So it lands at this sort of huts that were terminal for overseas flights. Mm. They really, literally were huts. Mm. And then you get into a bus to come to the centre of London, and we see these houses, and we say, 
I remember my sister saying, hey, look, those are the doll's houses. Because <laughs> we had doll's houses made in England. Mm. And so the little terraced houses mm. we passed through were doll's houses. And, um, so that was a very early memory. And then we stayed at the Regent Palace Hotel in um, the centre of London for a couple of weeks while they found mm. us accommodation. A large family had arrived. And um, I'll tell you one funny thing. I don't know, maybe I'll cut it out later on. <laughs> So we went downstairs, my sister and I marched downstairs because we were short of news. We were used to reading the newspaper mm. already in, mm. at home and here we came. So we went down and say, we looked at one or two newspapers and they seemed to us um, rather um, parochial local newspapers we thought and that we looked at the Telegraph or something and we looked at this newspaper which said News of the World. <laughs> we marched up with it. And my mother grabbed it hmm. and she tore it into pieces and said, we were not to go down by ourselves again. <laughs> 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 I remember that story. You made me think of uh, some. Anyway, the first impressions of England were very positive. We, we loved it. We, hmm. we enjoyed ourselves and we had, we, we used to go down to the restaurant and then all this English food seemed terrible. So I can remember my sister and I saying, what, what you would like is fried eggs, please, <laughs> for <laughs> dinner. <laughs> they were very kind to us. They gave us fried eggs. <laughs> right. Well, let's go on to then to Imperial College. Yes. Um, were there any inspiring teachers? Yes, Imperial was um, full of inspiring people. I was... Um, um, I first came into contact with um, Dr. Boothroyd, later to be Professor Boothroyd, had left Imperial College, and he taught me the transistors, which mm. was just coming up then. Mm. So I learnt about transistors, and then there was John Lamb, later to be head of uh, electrical engineering at Glasgow University, who taught me the physics of electronics. Uh, and then there was Mr. King who supervised my project and he was, um, he supervised my project and he had a big influence because he'd been here at Clare College mm. and later was to direct me to Cambridge. So lots of people there mm. were very, very good teachers. There was Dennis Gabor later to have his Nobel Prize for holography mm. who wanted me to stay on to do a PhD with him. Hmm. I was terrified of him. So <laughs> I said, no, thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you did quite well, presumably. I did well at Imperial College. I'm not quite sure how, but I did well at Imperial College. I think that uh, at that time, and as always afterwards, I kept telling people that the basis of engineering is mathematics. And if you can do maths, engineering is a rather easy subject. Hmm because everything else is built around this mathematical base. And I was good at maths at that point of my mm. life. Um, I got more marks than... I got the top marks, I think, in maths with my... In your year? In my year. <coughs> that brought me... That, that was very helpful later in life as well. Mm. So Imperial was a very good place to be in. I worked very hard there in my, particularly in my final year. Hmm. Were you doing anything else, student politics or um, going to plays or any social life? Um, I had um, I had a difficult experience there. My parents went back. Hmm. They only stayed in England for a couple of years. Hmm. Went back and left me and left me in charge of my younger brother. Hmm as well. I don't know who was in charge, I must admit, but <laughs> between us we were left here in England and had to live in digs and things. Yeah. Um, and I was more or less, look, he was at Latimer School, so he was a schoolboy still, mm. and six years younger than me. But they decided to leave him. I don't know why they decided to leave him, but they did. And uh, we had a difficult time. Mm. Um, Just financially, socially? Mm psychologically or in every way? Uh, in those days, you see, Britain 
has now race laws and mm. against racial discrimination. It mm. didn't in those days. Um, we had a lot of troubles. Mm. In I remember uh, interviewing Sir David King, and he said he came. He was thrown out by apartheid, and when he came to London looking for digs, they had all these notices saying no blacks or Irish wanted. <laughs> I was amazed. I, I remember that time, but you know, you forget so quickly. It was, that's exactly the notices we had to. My brother and I, my little brother and I, I was 20 and he was 14, but he was big and looked mm. about 15, 16, um, had the door slammed on our faces at places because we needed some digs to live in. We mm. wanted to share a room. Mm. So we were brothers, we just want to share a room and uh, we have somewhere to, somewhere to live. My parents actually left us in quite a nice place when we were there, but we lost it because there was some argument and the place got closed down or something. Mm. So we had to find other digs. So it was a difficult time. So I didn't do much at Imperial College except play some sport. We played mm. sport. Mm. I played, continued to play sport, but I didn't have enough time to play in the team mm. um, because I'd play in a club side with my brother, mm. local at Gunnersbury Park and so on, so didn't have time to play much sport um, at high level, which was mm. why my sport went down. Um, uh, but we, uh, we, we had a difficult time then, and it was Shepherd's Bush, and when was Enoch Powell's speech? The Rivers of Blood speech. Mm. So, anyway, at that time, there was a lot of racial tension. I remember being I remember both of us nearly getting beaten up by teddy boys. Mm. It was not racism, it was our fault actually. I, I'm thinking about it. We just laughed at their clothes. <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't have done it. <laughs> <laughs> they would have beaten anyone up who laughed at their clothes, but uh, they had no excuse in your case. I mean, I was thinking about whether to carry on that theme a little bit, because I think one of the reasons that Ken Moody particularly felt it would be very interesting to interview you I think he said that you were the first um, president or uh, master of a, of a Cambridge college from India or Pakistan. Was he right? No, no, no. Um, n n that's not right because Amartya Sen was master of well, Trinity. Yes. He's very distinguished. And but he, he was was he before you? He was just just before me a year yeah. or two. Mm. But I, what I was saying to Ken is that Amartya Sen wasn't an immigrant to this country. Mm. Mm. Uh, he was an Indian that day. Mm. Things. I am. I regard myself as British, mm. and totally British, because mm. I came here in '54 and took British nationality. Mm. I've never had any mm. link with Pakistan in, in, mm. in, 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 since then, and so I am an immigrant. Mm. I became an immigrant in whenever the. Mm. I mean, I became an immigrant right from the beginning, but there was laws which mm. made me change my status. So I was the first immigrant to be oh, elected to a mastership and, well, the second from Asia, mm. uh, but the first immigrant. But I was also the first, what I'm very proud of, is the first immigrant from Pakistan to be um, a professor at this university. Really? Mm. That's what I'm really proud of. I, I suppose if I think back, I don't want to get myself into trouble with the college, but the moment of sheer pleasure which I was thought I was walking on the moon or something, was when I was uh, made a professor. Because it was such a struggle. Struggle? Mm, to get there. Was it a personal chair or a...? It was a personal chair. When, when did you get it? I Remember the year? 1990 or maybe it's 1980 something. I, I'll have to look mm. it up. I'm mm. sorry, I should have perhaps Late done Late 80s or early 90s. Mm. Yeah. Because I was nine years a reader. Mm. Did you come through the system? I was yet? ten years a reader. Yes. And then I got a chair. It's tough, isn't it, mm. when you are a reader for that long and your mm. your work is going. Mm. So some people just get overlooked. Mm. It must have been. I was in the last chance because if you remember, they you were allowed to be put up for five years and then they had to take you off and then they put you up for five years and uh, this is my last chance. You know, I am of the time when they didn't have any, any such rules. Didn't they? Yeah. They didn't have rules. You were just a secret committee that promoted mm. you. Mm. In fact, I can tell you the more interesting story is when I was made a reader much earlier on. Mm. Because I was very fortunate in that I got a grant from the EPS, from the SCRC as it's called then, mm. which included a secretary. 
<laughs> it was such a large grant, it had mm -hmm. management mm -hmm. consequences. And I said, if I could do the research, how can I do it with a secretarial support? So the secretary noticed that there was a letter addressed marked private and confidential. It says, I haven't opened this for you uh, because it's marked private and confidential. Oh no, I said, that's my pensions thing. Leave it alone, we'll look at it later. So we did the whole day's work. Just as I was leaving, I said, let's look what this pension people want. And there's this letter comes out of the blue saying, we are minded to make you a reader. Would you like this job? <laughs> amazing, isn't it? It is amazing. Did they ever tell you what the job was? No, they told me that they would promote me to reader and I could have my readership assigned to any department of the university that was willing to have me. Mm, that was true. Now, I said, I've been in engineering for 20 years. I'd like a change. And I asked if I could go to the Cavendish. And Ian Nicol, who I regard as one of the great secretary generals of this university, mm. rang me up and said, are you sure you want to do this? I said, uh, yeah, it says so in the letter. It says, not many people have done this, you know. <laughs> I said, well, is it against the rules? And he said, no, it's not against the rules, but the rules are that if the department's willing to have you and the other department willing to let you go, you can go. <laughs> and England is a very civilized country. <laughs> Why am I saying this to you? So everything's done in a civilized way where it can be. So the two heads of departments had lunch together. And one said, but Ahmed wants to come to us. The other said, yes, sir, Ahmed wants to go. We don't want him to go. But if he really wants to come to you, he can go. <laughs> very civilized. It's totally civilized, yes. <laughs> well, do you know when that was? I mean, that would give us a date for your professorship, when you got your readership. Yeah, that is 1980? Yeah, so making 1989. Yeah, yes, some, some very close yeah. to that. But you were probably never told. Uh, I mean, I know what a reader is expected to do because I got my readership one year after you and I inquired. But actually, as you know, it's it's two lines on a piece of paper. Um, no so, do you know what the rules are? There are no duties specified for no. a reader. So I, I looked at the statutes and ordinances. Except you have to be available to your students for one hour at a specified place yeah, a week. Something like that. So <laughs> it was... Uh, um, I think that, uh, I said this earlier to you, that I think one of the most remarkable systems in the country is the educa our higher education system mm. and how fair it is. Mm. It is totally without any sort of bias, which we found in life in other aspects. Mm. But in the education system, we are very fair. And I, this interview is going wrong, isn't it? No, no, it's fine. It's going sort of out of sequence. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Because I wanted to tell you that my early experience, that I am a great admirer of this education system, and I not only know Cambridge, but I know Imperial a little bit mm. as well. And in my, I was made put on the examining board at the engineering department, and I was very young, mm. and I was quite worried about being on the examining board. And. Um, while we were class classing the students, we came across this character who had done badly in one particular aspect of engineering and not too badly in my disciplines. Mm. He'd got a third in mine, but he'd failed in the others, and the motion was put that this man should be failed. So John was chairing it, and as I've told you before, he was very partial to me, so I thought maybe that's why I was put on the board when I was very <laughs> young. So um, I said, well, he's not done too badly in my subjects. So John looked at me and said to me, our young member, may I say a few words to you as you're doing this for the first time? Our role here is to do entirely and only justice. We are not to show any um, sympathy or support for anybody unless we feel that would be a just decision. So if you feel that doing justice, you would like to pass this man, we will listen to you. But if you think it would be unjust to pass this man, we won't. So consider that advice I give you and then give us your opinion. So I thought about it and I said, well, the marks in 
these subjects are so low that this man cannot possibly serve as an engineer, as a professional engineer. So I said, no, having listened to you, I think I agree with you that it would be unjust to pass him. He was failed. <laughs> <laughs> I learned a lesson, however, mm. that there was no other way of judging. Mm. Just do justice. Mm. And it stood me in good stead, that advice. Those aspects that one hasn't taught you might have missed something. Oh, excuse me. I, 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 uh, for that interruption. Um, 